I have read over 140 books this year, and today I'm going to be telling you about the top 10 best books I read in 2022. Last year, instead of a top 10, I think I did a top 21 of 2021, and so I didn't realize how difficult it was going to be this year to narrow it down to just 10 books. And I really wanted the top 10 books to represent my reading interests across all the things I read, the top 10 across all categories. And I really wanted them to be representative of, if I look at them, they remind me of my 2022 reading year as a whole. So it was very difficult, but I think I accomplished it, and I'm very excited to tell you about all of these books. So I have four main categories that I'm going to go over. I decided to group these by category. We're going to start with the one literary fiction slash contemporary fiction book I want to tell you about. Then we have a couple thriller books I want to tell you about, a couple horror books I want to tell you about, and then the last group is psychological books that fit into this category of like psychological suspense or psychological horror. So first up, getting started with the first literary fiction slash contemporary fiction that I want to tell you about, we have Unlikely Animals by Annie Hartnett. I usually talk about my reading tastes and say I read primarily mystery thrillers and horror books, and then I have this other bucket of my reading where I like to read these realistic stories that have a little bit of magic sprinkled in. I feel like Katrina Leno is a great example of that. All of her books kind of fit in that category and I love Katrina Leno's stuff. I really loved books like Una Out of Order by Margarita Montemore. I even really enjoyed Acts of Violet by Margarita Montemore. And anything that plays with just the sprinkle of the unexplained in a story is one of my favorite types of things to read and Unlikely Animals fits into that bucket perfectly. There is a lot going on in this book but ultimately it's just a story about life and death and loss and family and being lost in life and the magic of living. And I love books like that that just really tug on your heartstrings and are really emotional. I connected to this book so much. I just absolutely adored it. You're following this woman named Emma Starling who was born in this small town and she's very well known in her small town because she is said to be this natural born healer. People think she has this healing touch about her. After she was born, she became this like town phenomenon and they were writing newspaper articles about her and she's just super well known. So she followed this path in life where she decided to be be a doctor because that's sort of the path that everyone assumed that she would take since she has this natural born ability to heal people which is not fully explained whether that is true or not which falls into that category of the little bit of unexplained magic that I love to see in books. She ends up going to medical school and realizes that's not the path for her and she secretly drops out of school and now she is returning home to her small town to help take care of her father who is nearing the end of his life. Her father Clive Starling is this one-of-a-kind character. He is so zany and just such a character. <laughs> he is such a character in this book. Clive has recently been dealing with the effects of a mysterious brain disease where he is starting to hallucinate things. Mostly what he's hallucinating is a lot of animals and the long dead naturalist Ernest Harold Baines who was a real life person who was really into nature and he was known for letting animals live with him, particularly a fox friend that he had. And so the book begins here with a picture of Ernest Harold Baines with his fox and you get a couple more of those throughout the story. The novel is completely made up, it's just inspired on that small bit of a person who ends up coming into the story as a character. And then meanwhile, as Emma's here taking care of Clive, all this is going on, also one of her friends from when she used to live here has gone missing and nobody in the town is really looking for her because they assume she has gone missing due to drugs and the cops just aren't that worried about it and so her and her dad are teaming up to try to find her friend as well. During all of this Emma's just really lost in life. She's got a lot going on around her. She's trying to find herself and find her friend as well. She's also trying to take care of her dad who she has a strained relationship with and other family members that are all mixed into this as well and it was just such a beautiful wonderful heartwarming heart-wrenching story that had all of the things in it and I highly recommend it if you tend to like emotional magical books like me. Now going into some of my top thrillers of the year, starting with The Burning Girls by C.J. Tudor. This was the first book by C.J. Tudor that I read, and as soon as I read it, I bought every other book she's written, got them on my shelves, read them all. I did a video where I rank all of her books and talk about all of them. I just became obsessed with C.J. Tudor this year. This is a thriller book that has some horror elements infused into it as well, as most of C.J. Tudor's writing does. It is set in this quaint English village where you're following the new vicar who is coming into town, and the vicar is bringing their daughter as well. You follow both the vicar's perspective and the teenage girl's perspective as they're coming into this new town that has a lot of history to it. 500 years ago, Protestant martyrs were betrayed, then burned. 30 years ago, two teenage girls disappeared without a trace. And a few weeks ago, the vicar of the local parish hanged himself in the nave of the church. 
So you're following Jack and Flo as they get to know the town and uncovering some of the dark secrets of its past. I love everything about this book from the writing to the character POVs, the setting, everything about it. I just really enjoyed. It was such a well-crafted mystery thriller with some horror elements in it as well. And it was great to just discover a new favorite author in CJ Tudor. I will definitely be picking up everything she writes. Next up is The Housemaid by Frida McFadden. This was such a surprise to me because I had heard some murmurings of this author and this book throughout the year but it just didn't seem like something I would particularly enjoy. It sounds like just your average domestic thriller and it kind of is just your average domestic thriller but I thought it was written so well and executed so well. I was so invested in the story. I could not put the book down. This is one of those books that I stayed up until like 1am just to finish which I very rarely do unless I am absolutely obsessed with the book and I was absolutely obsessed with this. In this story you're following this woman named Millie who is trying to pick her life back up and put it all back together. She's having a lot of difficulty getting a job because of secrets in her past and she gets this opportunity to go be a housemaid for this couple Nina and Andrew. She's gonna be taking care of their house and their child. Just basic keeping the house clean, picking the kid up from school, cooking the meals. It seems like an easy gig and she's also going to be able to live with them which is great because she has been living in her car. But once she moves in with them and starts doing the duties things start getting weird. Her bedroom only has a lock from the outside. The mom keeps kind of gas lighting her by saying she wants her to go do one thing and then as soon as she does it she berates her for doing the thing that she just asked her to do and the husband is super charming and starting to tempt Millie as well. She just gets put into this crazy situation. There's a lot going on in this house that she has to learn and it was so twisty, fast paced and fun. I love the ending of it especially. I thought it all wrapped together so well and a sequel of this book is coming which I am actually kind of nervous for because I just thought this was so perfect that I'm a little bit nervous to read a spinoff of like what happens next with the character that it follows but I'm still super excited for it. This is so far the only thing I've read from Frida McFadden but I definitely want to read more. And for the final thriller we have The Island by Adrian McKinty. This is a survival thriller that follows this family who goes off into this island off the coast of Australia and they end up getting trapped there after they have an incident and you're following them as they try to survive and get off the island and get back home. I absolutely love survival thrillers. They just get my heart pumped they get me so anxious on the edge of my seat. I've got to keep turning the pages to see how these characters are going to get out of an awful situation. It was probably the most exciting thriller I've read since I've read No Exit by Taylor Adams years ago. I just thought it was so good and so much fun. It has had sort of mixed reviews because if people don't like the survival element, that's kind of all this book has to offer because that's the entire setup of it. But if you do like survival thrillers, if you liked books like No Exit, I would highly recommend picking this up because it was just so much fun and it is going to also be made into a Hulu series pretty soon which I cannot wait to see. Now going into the horror books first is Sundial by Katrina Ward. This is the second book I have read from this author and I love this one even more. You're following this woman named Rob who just desperately wants to have a normal life. She comes from a dark past. There are secrets about her history that you're trying to piece together but she just wants to leave that all behind, move on, have a perfect life, the perfect husband, perfect kids, perfect house and it seems like she has all of that but then one of her daughters starts acting kind of weird, doing weird things with animal bones and pictures and being really mean to the other sister and she starts seeing traces of herself in this girl and she's getting really worried that history is going to repeat itself. You don't know what that means. It just gives you this ominous entrance into the story. So she decides to take that daughter and take her back to her hometown Sundial where she grew up and just have a good reset moment with her where she has to get her away from the other sister before she hurts the sister. And then you follow the story of this mother and daughter back in the desert, back in sundial and you don't really know what's gonna go on. You get both of their perspectives and it sort of seems like someone's not gonna make it out of sundial alive. I absolutely love this one and the tension that it builds throughout the story. I love a good mother-daughter story too so I really like that element and then I also really liked getting flashbacks of the past and piecing that together to understand what happened to Rob in the past to inform why she is the way she is in the future and what's happening with her daughter and how that all pieces together. This one also had a really interesting creative twist that I haven't really seen done before and I really enjoyed that. The atmosphere of it was great in the desert. The characters were great. Katrina Ward's writing is great. It's all just amazing. I highly recommend it. Next up is This Thing Between Us by Gus Moreno. Throughout this story you're following this man who has recently lost his wife and you're following him while he is grieving the loss of his wife in some strange circumstances. Right before his wife died, they ended up getting this technology device called an ITSA, which is similar to an Alexa. 
and I tried to whisper it so it doesn't set off yours hopefully. <laughs> but there Itza started acting weird and sending strange items to the house that they didn't deliver and saying weird things and just being really weird. And then this incident happens where his wife ends up dying and that becomes this huge spectacle. And that's when you're thrown into the story and you kind of get some pieces of what was happening before and right during and right after the death as well. So you're seeing the whole picture. After his wife's passing, he just wants to get away from it all and go out in the woods and be alone and deal with his grief and escape everything that's going on, but it all catches up to him rather quickly. This book had some of the most beautiful writing that I read this year. It was so poetic and so beautiful and deep and haunting and wonderful. And this is this author's debut, so I absolutely cannot wait to see what they do next because this was incredible writing. I will say the second half of this book does take its way into some cosmic horror, a bit of unexplained stuff, some confusing stuff, which was a little difficult to follow. So I can't say that I fully understood every aspect of this book, but I did really love everything about it. The writing was just, oh my goodness, it was so good. The back of this describes it as a startlingly, darkly funny horror novel about grief and rage, the loneliness of living between cultures, and the all too real oppressive intimacy of technology. Next up is the book you're all sick of hearing me talk about by now. We thought it was Crossroads by Laurel Hightower. I talk about it all the time because I truly just loved it so much. It was my favorite horror novella that I read this year, and I just can't stop talking about it. You're following this woman named Chris, whose adult son died in a car accident, and she frequently likes to go visit the site of his death. One day while she's there, she sheds blood on the death site, and then she believes that she starts seeing his ghost. And it turns into a story of how much she's willing to sacrifice to get back some semblance of her loved one. It is a very dark story about grief and what you're willing to sacrifice for your loved ones. It is such a touching story of a mother and a son's connection. It is visceral, it is graphic, it is gruesome, but it is, oh my goodness, it is so good. <laughs> Again, this is another favorite author that I discovered this year. I ended up picking up more from Laurel Hightower. I read Below, another novella from her, and absolutely love that one too. So definitely an author that I will be keeping up with. Next is A Head Full of Ghosts by Paul Tremblay. I've read a few things from Paul Tremblay now, and I enjoy everything that I read from him. This one, I didn't know how I was going to feel though, because there's very mixed reviews for it. I see people either love it or hate it, which is pretty common for Paul Tremblay's works, but I do see a mix of people who like love certain Paul Tremblay books, but hate this one or vice versa. So I was a little bit worried that there was going to be something different about it that wouldn't make me enjoy it as much as I have the other ones. But nope, absolutely loved everything about it. Such a brilliant story, such wonderful writing from Paul Tremblay. I just love the psychological and ambiguous nature of a lot of his books. And this one has some really interesting elements to it as well. You're following two timelines in this story. You're following the present day and 15 years ago, what happened when this girl was a child. There were these two sisters in this family, Marjorie and Mary. And when they were children, Mary's the younger sister, Marjorie's the older sister. Marjorie started showing signs of schizophrenia when she was about four 14, or at least that's what they were saying. But it was unclear whether she was having issues with her mental health, or if maybe there was something paranormal going on with her, or if maybe she was faking it all for attention. But during that time, the family capitalizes on this weird thing that's going on with her, and they end up getting put on this like paranormal explanation type show, and this documentary crew comes out and is reporting all these things that are going on in their house. And you as the reader also don't know, is she faking it? Is it supernatural? Is she looking for attention? Is there something going on with her mental health, you have no idea. <laughs> You're just trying to piece it together too. And then the other timeline is 15 years in the future. You're following the younger sister who's all grown up now, who's recounting the details of what it was like back then because this show has blown into a phenomenon. Everyone in the world knows about it. It's this big cultural thing and people wanna know from the younger sister's perspective, what was really going on? Was it really paranormal or was it all staged for reality TV? This book was so good, so good. So psychological, so complex. I love every element of it. You get like blog entries too from a true crime blogger that come into it. I adored everything about this book. I actually read it on audiobook when I listened to it for the first time. And then I picked up a physical copy so I can read it again physically and just have it on my shelves and just read all the lines again that I love so much. It was just such a wonderful book. Although I am biased because I feel that way about everything I read from Paul Tremblay. But if you like Paul Tremblay like I do, then definitely recommend picking this one up if you have not gotten to it yet. And finally, my last two books fit in this psychological category. The first one is Confessions by Kane Minato, and this is a psychological revenge story. You're following this woman who is a teacher, and recently she has lost her daughter. Her daughter ended up dying in a tragic incident, and the teacher thinks she knows what went on. She thinks she's pieced it all together, and she has decided to resign from her position teaching, but before she leaves, she's giving one last lesson to the class, telling them the story of what she believes went on, and 
and starting to unfold a maniacal plot for revenge. The story is told in I believe six chapters and you get different perspectives in almost every chapter so you're reading these long stories that are coming in different pieces of time and it's trying to like build the whole puzzle together for you as you're understanding from all these different perspectives what happened and what's happening now in this revenge plot. It is so twisty, so dark, so good. When I finished the first chapter my jaw dropped when I realized what was going on. It gets intense so fast and it's such a fun puzzle to try to piece together while reading. This is another one that I listened to on audio and then again bought the physical book because I was like I need this in my hands now. It was so good. I cannot wait to read more from this author because this is one of the most fun psychological dark twisty things I've read in a while. And finally is We Spread by Ian Reed. This is a psychological horror story from the same author as I'm Thinking of Ending Things. In a similar way to Paul Tremblay, Ian Reed has such a unique writing style that people either love or hate and I definitely love it. In this story you're following an older woman named Penny whose partner has recently passed away. Now she's living by herself until she can't any longer. She starts having issues with her memory and it's just not becoming safe for her to live alone anymore. And it turns out that this arrangement was set up before her partner's passing where they agreed that Penny would be moved to this facility when she could no longer take care of herself. Except she doesn't remember that because she's losing some of her memories, but she decides to trust that process and go live in this facility. And then once she gets there, she starts having increasing issues with her memory and the passage of time and understanding if she's in a safe environment. As the story goes on, Penny wonders and you as the reader wonder if she's losing her grip of reality or if she is in some kind of super dangerous situation. I adored everything about this book. It was written so wonderfully and brilliantly. It's written in sort of a vignette style so it reads very quickly but it also leaves all these moments for pause and impact in the story. I really think when it's done right, writing that vignette style can be so effective for psychological and or horror books and it worked so well in this one. The story just makes you think so much about how we treat the elderly in our society and what it means to age and how scary that can be and what a horrific experience it is to age because of how horrified we are by aging in our society. It's one of those books where you can walk away with it with multiple different interpretations and it all works. So it's one of those books that I love talking about with people when they finish it. I'm like, what do you think happened? Here's my theories. Here's what I thought during this part and here's what I took away and this grand message that I got from it. And when a book can do that for me, it's just such an obvious favorite. I really enjoyed it and I definitely can't wait to read more from Ian Reed in the future. So that's it for my top 10 favorite books of 2022. It was such a good reading year. I'm so happy to have all these books in my life as new favorites. They will be sticking with me for a long time. And I hope if you haven't read any of them and they sound interesting to you that you give them a chance to and that you can see how wonderful they are. Let me know down in the comments below if you've read any of these. Let me know what you think about them and also let me know what were some of your favorites from 2022, especially if you think that I will really enjoy them as well. But that is it for me. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you all in the next video. Bye!